This is the Pines. This is one of the documented underground railroad houses in Chester County, Pennsylvania. And one of its most famous residents was Bartholomew Fussell that we see here. Okay, hi everybody. I'm here with Karen Marshall today at the Pines. And she's going to tell you a little bit about the history of this building that's associated with the underground railroad. Hi everybody. Welcome to the William H. Gillingham House, affectionately known as the Pines in Kennett Township in Chester County, Pennsylvania. My name is Karen Marshall and I'm a member of the Historical Commission and I'd like to give you just a brief history on the building. Seth will be giving you more details. So the building was constructed in 1823 by William Dillingham and has historically been known as a stop on the Underground Railroad. Because of the association of the Pines and its owners with the Underground Railroad and the abolition movement, and the intact condition of the basement and sub-basement, which Seth will be talking about, the house is extremely important and has been recommended as, possibly, as a possible nomination to the National Register of Historic Places. Recognizing the importance of the structure to our area's history, we are so grateful to the Kennett Township supervisors who stepped in and took possession of the house, saving it from demolition to become just one more construction site on the Route 1 corridor. I think it's very important to note that something else can be learned from this building, in addition to the Underground Railroad. Since it's constructed and owned, it was constructed and owned by doctors. So for those of you who can't see, we're standing in the middle of a medical complex, and Seth is going to explain to you what some of the state-of-the-art technology was going on 200 years ago with medicine, and I think we'll all be very happy that we can go to these more modern places today. Yeah, because this building is almost 200 years old. It's just two years showing. I know. I know, Seth. I'm really glad I can go across the street to get my blood drawn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. They don't have leeches over there now? I don't think so. Okay. I hope not. So we're actually standing on the 1731 land owned by Abraham Taylor, from whom our famous Kennet poet Bayard Taylor descended, and whose grandfather was one of the early settlers of Chester County. Taylor's stone home still stands at the entrance of the Pico headquarters just down the road heading into Kennet Borough. Taylor filed a claim against the King of England in 1777 for the damage to his home and his property by the Crown forces who were here, 8,500 of them in fact, were camped right in front of where I'm standing down McFarland Road waiting to attack General Washington the next day for the Battle of Brandywine. I'm sure this was a very busy and perhaps dangerous place to be in September 11, 1777. Again, the home was constructed in 1823, and Dr. Gillingham was a, med was a doctor who was also part of the Underground Railroad. He and the doctors who owned it after him until 1841. So again, it was probably a dangerous place to be since we aren't very far from the Delaware border and there were slave catchers waiting to pursue slaves who were trying to escape and gain freedom. It's not clear when the property was first called the Pines, but it had that name as early as 1882. A nursery business operated on the property throughout the 20th century until the house and the barn, which I'm sad to say is no longer standing, were partitioned in 1966. The house was used as a professional office building until the property was sold, I think around 2010, and then as I said, it was slated for demolition for what some of us call progress. Anyway, I think, Seth, is that a succinct history? Yes, that's very good. <laughs> Thank Thanks you so, so much. much. I'm glad okay. to be here. Yeah, great. As Karen mentioned, the Pines was built in 1823. And although it was originally a federal style building, today we would call it colonial revival as a result of its alterations. The Pines is an example of one of the types of the federal style that's rarely discussed. These houses were built with a gambro roof. And one of the interesting interior features that they all share is that 
In the basement, they have a sub-basement level where there's often a root cellar. Okay, so getting back to this house, all the windows were just recently replaced and the dormers were also rebuilt and they've been changed. Let's go around to the west side and you can see this interesting window pattern here. One of the things about houses of the 1820s is that the separate fireplaces and the rooms on the first floor made it possible to put a window in between those two flues which results in this type of window pattern on an end wall that you see here. Let's go back to the front and we'll go around to the east end of the house. This is one of those houses that is kind of common in this part of Pennsylvania where you have these chimneys with separate flues above the eave line. This is called an H chimney. This house has several additions on the back, most of which you can see on the east elevation and also the north elevation. Let's take a look inside now. The main entrance opens up into the center hall. And as you can see, there's some ventilation equipment that was just recently put in here and they had to remove the ceiling in order to attach it up there. In the back, you can see these stairs that end with a, a volute rail. This was a type of stair that became common in the 1920s. And also we have French doors that lead from the center hall to the adjacent rooms and they also date to the 20s. Let's go into the west room. This was originally two rooms, but at the time they made these changes in the 1920s, they removed the partition wall, so it's just one big room, which was a common thing back then. One of the fireplaces survives, the other one has been replaced with bookcases. And the second entrance into this, the northern room here is gone. Um, this is an original door, eight panel door, you would see in the late federal period. Now when you go into the east end of the house, you see this interesting corner fireplace here. And this feature I'd like to spend just a little bit of time telling you about. This is a, an interior feature that you see in houses in the early 20th century. Let me just see if I can get a better vantage point and um, we'll just talk about this for a minute. This feature we're looking at is called a colonnade, which is an early 20th century way of opening up the room for people who are interested in open concept living spaces. Colonnades were especially common in American four squares in the early 20th century. Colonnades at this point fell into five different categories. This one happens to be the bookcase colonnade. These appear in millwork catalogs from 1913 until 1931. Although, for the most part, millwork companies stopped carrying the bookcase colonnade after 1923. Returning to the pines, though, you can see that this colonnade is almost exactly like what the catalog shows, although it has a different number of lights and the two leaves of that casement opening into the bookcase. Now let's go up into the room in the northeastern corner of the original part of the house. This was originally the kitchen, but as you can see, after the changes of about 1920, it's just another living space, a very simple space. Here's where the kitchen fireplace would have been. If we turn around and face the colonnade again, you can see this one has shelves on the eastern side of the colonnade. The kitchen wing off the northeastern corner of the original part of the house has been renovated several times. There's not a whole lot of interesting stuff to see here, but I did want to point out this window with the plow and groove mark here and the window chain. Let's go back to the center hall. I just want to point out a few things here beside the stairs, and then we'll go up to the second floor. As we come around to the side, I want to show you an interesting little thing here. They, the spindles weren't actually made the right way. They're toenailed in where they should have a square tenon on the bottom that holds them in. And then below the stairs, this is a door that formerly accessed the stairs that went down to the basement. And what they've done is they took a door and they sawed it vertically through the middle. And here is one of the rails of that door. And now this is just a closet. So we can close these doors and we'll go back to the stairs and we'll go upstairs. This 
transitional piece that marks the distinction between the horizontal rail on the second floor and the diagonal rail going down the stairs is called the ramp. The second floor also has a center hall plan and looking around at the various doors what we'll see is on the far left is a door that leads into the kitchen wing and then we have one door that leads into the northeast bedroom, a door that leads to the attic, a door that leads to the southeast bedroom, a door that leads to a storage space that's now a bathroom, and two doors on the west wall that lead to the two bedrooms. A common feature in federal style houses is to have the casing of doors on the second floor to meet together like this. It gives the appearance of a pilaster between the doors. The woodwork in the bedrooms on the second floor is fairly consistent throughout, so I'm only going to look at the bedrooms right now that are in the western end because of this interesting feature right here. This is a set of pocket doors between the two bedrooms, and obviously this is not supposed to have been here. I imagine that this was actually located on the first floor, and when they inserted that colonnade, they moved these doors upstairs. When the two doors are hinged and they meet in the middle, they're called parlor doors. This type of door that we're looking at right here is today called pocket doors. That's a label that was coined in 1953, and before that, these were usually called rolling doors. On occasion, though, they would have rollers on the bottom that would roll on a track, and those are called sliding doors. If we go back down to the first floor and then into the kitchen addition at the northeast corner, we have these stairs that were originally exterior stairs that go down into the basement. I'm sorry for the dark footage here, but as you go down into the basement, you'll see that there are several interesting features. It's kind of hard to see things down there. The primary room that you come down into has this hearth support you can see right here, and if we turn, you'll see a doorway that goes into a really dark room that historically had no, which is right there, which historically had no windows. Right now, there is some light that comes in from outside. This was an important, and look at that latch there on that batten door. Isn't that outstanding? This is the room where the doctors who lived here, like Bartholomew Fussell, would have stored all of their medicines and their leeches and things that doctors needed in the 19th century to practice their profession. And this room would have always been sealed. Although the doctors here were conductors on the Underground Railroad, they would not have wanted people to come in this room because they might break some of the medicines in those glass bottles that they would have had there. These stairs lead down to the sub-basement, which is really a root cellar. This was a common feature in the late federal period to have the, a root cellar actually inside the house as a sub-basement level. In the 19th century, these stairs would have had a board that could be placed across the top of them so that you could put a, a rug over that board or you could put sand over the board and nobody would know that the steps are even there. When you go down the steps and turn to the right, you'll see this barrel vaulted root cellar, and in the far end of it is a well. It's kind of sad, but there's construction debris from the recent work that's been put down into the root cellar, kind of messed it up. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation about the pines. This is a very interesting house, and if you stayed until the end, you got to see something that you've probably never seen before.